incarnation of Vishnu. Uh, so he was teaching according to the Vedic standard, although he superficially rejected the Vedas just to stop the unauthorized animal killing in the guise of Vedic sacrifice. But actually he was teaching, you know, theism. Whereas the Shakyamuni Buddha was teaching voidism, which is completely opposed to Vedic theism. So we can understand that when the real Buddha comes, he's not going to contradict himself. He's not going to say one thing in the Vedas and then say another thing when he's teaching. Therefore, the uh, voidist Buddhist philosophy that we know today must have been a product of an ordinary human being. So the Shakyamuni Buddha, he didn't have the unlimited intelligence or the perfect understanding that the original Buddha had. So we get the Buddhism of today, which is just this nonsense concoction. Uh, in fact, some of the arguments that the Buddhists advance are really uh, good ideas for God. Huh? For example, they say that the illusion of the material world is not in the material world. Huh? When we say the material world is an illusion, what do we mean? Do we mean that the material world it, it really doesn't exist? Well, some people think like that, but we don't accept that. Our understanding is that the material world is real because it's the energy of the Lord. And one school of Buddhism, they say something very similar in Madhyamaka philosophy. They say that the material world is real, but our understanding of it is an illusion. And that's actually very close to Vaishnava philosophy. Uh, the material energy is real because it's energy of the Lord. But the way we see it is wrong because we see that individual objects have independent existence. See? No strings, no wires, huh? Huh? nothing up my sleeve, <laughs> no sleeve. <laughs> but it looks like it has its own existence. Huh? But actually, the existence of this glass is completely dependent upon a chain of causes. Huh? Somebody had to mine the iron, then the, somebody had to smelt it and make it into steel, huh? and then mix it with different other metals and make stainless steel, and then somehow or other it was rolled or uh, turned or molded or whatever the process they used to make the glass. And then somebody had to ship it and put it in the store, and so on and so on. And there's this whole link a chain of links of causes. Huh? The, the scientists say that these heavy elements like iron come from supernova explosions. So billions of years ago, some supernovas had to explode and spew out all this iron into the galaxy, and then it condensed into clouds, and then eventually made the planet that we live on. Yeah, if you believe that story. <laughs> anyway... <laughs> Anyway, here we are with this glass. It appears to have its own separate existence, but actually its existence is very conditional upon all these other causes that went before. It doesn't have independent existence at all. And someday this glass is going to get lost or broken or something will happen to it, and it'll wind up going back into the ground again, and maybe some archaeologist 10,000 years from now, we'll find it and say, look, they were civilized. They had metal glasses. <laughs> <laughs> <Some notes>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, we don't know, actually, what real existence means. Uh, real existence means unconditional. Just like we were talking before about the difference between relative truth and absolute truth. Relative truth is what? Temporary. Temporary, conditional, dependent. Huh? 
on, on the circumstances. Whether it's true or not just depends on what's going on. But absolute truth is <laughs> eternal, unconditional, it's always true. Yeah. So, similarly, material existence is relative existence because it depends on something else. Whereas, spiritual existence is unconditional, absolute existence, because it doesn't depend on anything. Somebody flying around? Oh, okay. We always get invaded by bugs because it's, it's, the lights are on and it's, you know, it's warm in here. But anyway, so relative existence is temporary and conditional. Absolute existence is eternal and unconditional. That means, as Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, never is there a time when I did not exist, nor you, nor all these kings, nor at any time in the future will we ever cease to be. The soul is eternal, immortal, indestructible, cannot be cut into pieces by any weapon, cannot be, ever be destroyed in any way. That's Krishna's statement. That's Krishna's guarantee. So that means we already have eternal life. We don't have to do anything to get it. Huh? So then the question becomes, what are we going to do with it? Uh, we have this eternal existence. So are we just going to like sit around and, and work in the material world like we've been doing? Huh? Because we all experience that our material work is not satisfying. Because, why? It's relative work. It's conditional. It's temporary. And its fruits are also temporary and conditional and imperfect. And worst of all, it produces karma. So by this karma, we become bound to the wheel of birth and death, and we have to take another body in order to experience the karmic reactions of our present activities. Why would we want to do that? If there's something better, huh? and there is something better, it's called devotional service or spiritual activities. Absolute activities. Absolute activities means that the nature of the activity is spiritual from the beginning to the end. Huh? The objective, the method, and the beneficiary of the activity are all spiritual, all eternal. Devotional service means that the activities that we take up in this life are the same as the activities in the spiritual world. They're qualitatively identical. Just like in many uh, forms of yoga, they will do some kind of sadhana for many years, and then they'll attain their realization. And then what happens? They give up their yoga. They don't practice their yoga anymore because now they have the mystic powers or they have the, the vision or the insight that they were seeking all this time. But that's material. Why? Because it's not eternal. In devotional service, we're chanting the holy name in this lifetime. And then in the next lifetime, when we go to the spiritual world, what are we going to be doing? Chanting the holy name. Huh? We're hearing about Krishna in this lifetime. And then when we go to the spiritual world, what do we do? We hear about Krishna. Huh? Then we serve Krishna in this body. And then the next body, we're going to be serving Krishna. So these are eternal activities. And they not, not only do they never end, but they constantly give us increasing pleasure. Uh, we were talking last night about the etymology right, of the word Krishna. The derivation of the word roots. Krish means one who does or one who makes something, or making something, or doing something. And na means pleasure. Not just any kind of pleasure, but transcendental pleasure. So Krishna 
is one who makes or one who produces or supplies transcendental pleasure to all his devotees. That's why Krishna is the primary name of God. Because God is the source of everything enjoyable. Yeah? He's the reservoir of pleasure. And when Prabhupada came out with this book in the 1960s, Krishna, the Reservoir of Pleasure, I mean, people were freaking out because they never thought of God as the source of pleasure. But if you think about it for a minute, everything that we have that we enjoy is made by God. It all comes from Him. So He's the source. He's the reservoir. If, if the things that we enjoy give us pleasure, then where is the stock of that pleasure? Huh? Like when the rain falls, it comes from the ocean. When we see the light, we know it comes from the 